Do we take water for granted? Who knows, despite the recent deluge in New Mexico, our rivers are still at risk. So how do we strike a balance between human needs and the ecosystems that rely on that same water? And I may have producer Megan Camerick sat down with Sandra Postel. She is National Geographic Freshwater Fellow. And Beth Bardwell, she's director of the Freshwater Conservation with Audubon, New Mexico, to talk about taking water conservation and restoration into the 21st century. Sandra, I want to start with you. You have written in regards to rivers that denial is not just a river in Egypt, it flows in every one of us. Talk about that. Well, you know, I think we're used to thinking about water coming from the sky. It's always there, it's always been there, it's always going to be there. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of denial about how serious our water problems have become. You know, water is finite, um, and our demands from population growth and consumption growth um, have been bumping up against the limits of that supply in more and more river basins, including the Rio Grande, including the Colorado, and many other river basins around the world. So the denial is we don't really have a problem that falls from the sky. It's always going to be there. It but comes out of the tap. Exactly. As long as we turn on the tap and there's water, everything's good. But in fact, there's a lot of stress around the world with regard to water, including here in the Southwest and in New Mexico. So this denial is at a very a personal level as well as policy level, upper echelons? Very much so, but we're starting to get it now. I mean, when you see dry rivers cropping up all over the world, there's a very visible sign that we're in trouble. Um, less clear with groundwater. You know, we, it's literally sort of out of sight, out of mind. And that's a problem that I really worry about now because we don't see it. Mm. And we have this sense that there's these vast reservoirs of water underground but we're over pumping groundwater here again in New Mexico, across the Southwest, all over the world. So if you add up you know, all the over pumping of groundwater, it's a lot of water and a lot of it's growing food. So we have to ask you know, if we're you know, essentially taking tomorrow's water to meet our food needs today, where's the water gonna come from to grow the food for tomorrow? So it's, it's a concern that, that we're not really addressing. You've written extensively about the several books and you founded the Global, Waters, <clears throat> Global Water Policy Project and you say that we humans need to adopt a water ethic. What does that mean? Why is it necessary? Well, I think it's, it's a couple things. It's, first, I think it's a new way of thinking about water, a new kind of mindset around water. You know, if you think about how we've valued water in the past, it's we attribute value to water when we take it out of a river or out of an underground aquifer, and we put it to use on a farm or in a city or in a factory, um, and that's how it acquires value. And recently, we're beginning to understand that water actually has value in its place in nature, that you know, a healthy river gives us healthy fisheries and birds and wildlife, it's cleansing of our water. Wetlands do a tremendous job of not only removing pollution, but attenuating floods and mitigating droughts. And so these are really important benefits for us, and yet we haven't valued that. So happily now, we're starting to understand that water doing its thing in nature is important and has value. So, so now the trick is finding the balance. What is the balance um, between those you know, extractive uses of water and letting nature have the water that it needs. For me personally, the water ethic is a little deeper than that. It's that water's life and everything on earth that's living needs water to survive. And so for me, the ethic is really about stewardship. It's about, um, you know, recognizing that we ha you know, we're pulling the levers on water now. We're operating a lot of rivers like plumbing systems. So the other life in this world depends on us. And you know, we have to sort of step up and be stewards of not only water, but all the life that depends on water. So for me, you know, what really guides my thinking is something like you know, that we, we need to provide enough water for all living things before some get more than enough. And that's going to be hard to implement, but it's a guiding principle that we should be thinking about what the rest of life needs before we take a whole lot more than we really need. That's a great uh, segue to Beth, because I, as you know, I interviewed the authors of Rainy and the Rio Grande mm -hmm, recently, mm -hmm. and historically there's this idea that water or in the river, in the Rio Grande, that made it to the Gulf of Mexico was wasted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it goes that's to what true. she's talking about, how we value, what is the value of water? Is that attitude still clinging on? 
a little bit? Um, I think New Mexico has made some great strides um, in the last decade in terms of beginning to recognize the value of keeping water in stream. So we've had the Strategic Water Reserve, um, current statute on the books now that allows the Interstate Stream Commission to, to uh, obtain permits to leave water in stream for threatened and endangered species, sensitive species. Um, and then also recently, um, I think the state engineer has um, uh, approved a couple of uh, alternative tools or, or innovative solutions to keeping water in stream. He's indicated that he would um, look favorably on an application to lease water for uh, in-stream flow. And that would be a temporary lease, uh, not a permanent drying of agricultural land, let's say. And um, as well as we have a water conservation program uh, on the statute on the books as well that allows people to um, place water in stream or to forbear and, and avoid forfeiture. So I think there are tools available. So uh, yeah, I want to ask you about this initiative that Audubon led, um, and Sandra, I think you were involved in as well, but um, the Elephant Butte Irrigation District will now allow farmers to sell water rights mm -hmm. that can be used to help grow riverside vegetation, mm -hmm. not just water crops. So why is right. this such a big deal? Why was this a big shift in how things are usually done? Right. Well, I think it was a, an innovative program uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, Elephant Butte Reservoir is a single purpose um, reservoir, and by that I mean it's authorized only for agriculture. Yeah, and I did not know that until I started researching It was That's one of the oldest reservoirs um, and Rio, uh, Bureau of Reclamation projects in the nation. And at that time, people weren't really thinking about, you know, uh, multiple benefits uh, for water storage, whether it's drinking water or environmental fisheries um, and so on. So it's authorized only for agriculture, and although there there are policy mechanisms to um, allow that water to be used for drinking water, like it is in El Paso. They tend to be uh, burdensome. And so we worked with the uh, Bureau of Reclamation and Elephant Butte Irrigation District to agree to a policy that said, hey, if you're going to grow cottonwoods, you're going to grow willows, these native vegetation, isn't that really similar to growing a crop? And they agreed that, yes, they would consider that and characterize that as agricultural use. And so <clears throat> we had Elephant Butte Irrigation District has adopted a policy to do that. And we're in the process now of trying to execute uh, our first water, water acquisitions <coughs> down there. I want to, Sandra, is that something, uh, a deal like that, is that taking place around the West? Is this a uh, common It's quite innovative. And I'd have to say I had nothing to do with okay, that particular project. So <laughs> Beth and Audubon get all the credit for that. Um, it, it's really, but I think it shows, you know, it's a great example of how we are trying to, um, you know, sort of update our thinking about water and realize that these things do have value. And it's really about maximizing the value in an economic sense. You know, it, if, we, if we understand that water has value in supporting wetlands and, you know, the kind of work that Beth just described, we're actually getting more value out of that water, you know, because it's doing its work in agriculture, but it's also serving these other important purposes that we haven't paid attention to. And certainly in the work that I've been doing with National Geographic in projects throughout the West, we're, we're starting to see that there are these innovative tools we can use that you know, make sure we have, yes, healthy economies and healthy productive agriculture, but also give rivers back and wetlands back some of the water that they need. And that's very exciting to me, and that's a great example of that. And there are many other, several other, at least, examples of this. You wrote a book called Pillar of Sand, <coughs> looking at the history of irrigation, which is you know, 6,000 years old. Um, uh, where do you see irrigation going in the 21st century, 21st century as scarcity increases? Well, to me, the silver lining in this water scarcity, water stress picture is that you know, irrigation in many, many places still operates pretty much the way it did a century ago or a century and a half ago. Um, and farmers, being good business people, basically respond to the incentives that are put before them. And we really haven't um, provided enough incentives to bring irrigation into the 21st century. What would those look like? Upgrading irrigation infrastructure. Okay. Um, we worked on a project uh, with our Change the Course campaign with National Geographic and our partners um, in the Verde River in Arizona recently, where um, essentially the irrigators were using a ditch system just the way they did 150 years ago. With an automation of that ditch system, the farmers realized they could get the same amount of water they needed 
but leave some in the river so that for that five miles of, of uh, river that had been impacted by the ditch and, and therefore going dry in the summer, that river is now healthier for that long That's stretch. So interesting. So they're using the same amount of water, yeah. but automating this somehow. So that you know, ir irrigators that. were taking more than they needed simply because the ditch system allowed them to do that. Mm. And, and the irriga irrigation mindset is, you know, take as much as you can because if we don't use it, we'll lose it and this kind of thing. But with this infrastructure upgrade, it gave them the confidence that they were going to get the water they needed, but the river would also get more water because the automation allowed that to become more precise. And so it, it shows, again, increased value in water because the Verde now has a healthier river in the summer for fishing, for boating. Um, beautiful river. It's a beautiful desert river. Comes kind of out of Sedona, Flagstaff, mm -hmm. down, flows down, becomes a wild and scenic stretch. I have seen that river. It's so lovely. it's much, yeah, much mm -hmm. more valuable now <clears throat> for all uses. And that's, I think, going to be the way of the future. And, mm -hmm. and irrigation has so many possibilities for improved efficiency um, where you get more value, more productivity um, out of the water, more you know, value per unit that we extract and leave more than in. So drip irrigation, more efficient sprinklers, irrigation upgrades, these are all technologies that are out there that we can begin to deploy you know, to, to achieve this better balance. I want to ask Beth because 80% uh, of our water in New Mexico goes towards um, agricultural irrigation. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting. Is that sustainable? given these kinds of tools? Do we need to rethink that? And how do we do that? Because that's a sensitive issue here. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think where um, we need to really put a lot of our attention and, and our brain power is finding those innovative solutions, collaborative solutions with existing water rights owners. How can we you know, integrate management across the system <coughs> to now benefit multiple uses? Uh, so an example of that might be looking at integrated reservoir management uh, on the upper Rio Grande and through, through the Albuquerque Reach. How are we operating those reservoirs and what type of water is allowed to be stored there and for what purposes? And if we could uh, maximize flexibility in those reservoirs, could we, as water is delivered from point A to point B, uh, do a lot of environmental good or benefit? And we've seen that. Um, a little bit uh, with the Cochiti uh, reservoir deviation that the Corps of Engineers was allowing for several years to provide that spawning flow, kind of that snow melt spring runoff. And we got a lot of fish spawning out of that and a lot of cottonwood willow regeneration. So how can we do that in a way that also meets our compact deliveries and also provides water for, for irrigators? You know, in terms of um, sustainability, I think that uh, in the light of drought and our variable water supply, even outside of climate change, uh, we need to be thinking smarter ways about how to use our water more efficiently um, with growing population, um, with um, changes in cropping trends. Um, I think we all need to be trying to uh, make water do double duty as it's used, double benefits, um, and and, and minimize the amount we're using. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to do that. So there have been a lot of efforts around New Mexico and I'm sure other places in the West to get consumers and water utilities to focus on conservation. How important is that in the grand scheme of things? I don't know if you want to talk, Sandra? <clears throat> I think it's hugely important. Um, you know, agriculture, as we've been talking about, is the dominant user of water. It takes the lion's share of the water that we're using in most places in the West and many parts of the world. But, you know, our urban uses of water, while not a high percentage, are very concentrated. Um, and so they can put a lot of strain and stress on the local, regional, you know, water supply. And so, and also it takes a lot of energy to move water around, you know, to deliver it and then to collect it, treat the wastewater. So it's, it's, uh, it touches on both water and energy um, mm. in terms of our water use. So it's, it's, you know, the conservation of water in urban settings is such a win-win all around in terms of, you know, preserving water supplies as well as reducing energy consumption, chemical use for the treatment. Um, infrastructure development, how big a reservoir do we need, how big do our pipes have to be to deliver and collect. So it's, it's really a, both an economic and an environmental issue and, and we're really starting to catch on to that idea and you can see cities across the West really reducing, including Albuquerque, reducing their per capita water use. We often have a ways to go but educating consumers, particularly about outdoor water use, uh, which in the West is often 50 percent or more of household use. 
Uh, so paying people to you know have native landscape, rip out their lawns and have native right. landscaping. We're seeing a number of cities doing that. Our time is it's just about up, but I just want a quick <coughs> question: Do we pay enough for water? Do we pay? Is it too cheap? Um, Since I, we have people watering green lawns, give me a quick answer. <laughs> um, I would say yes. We aren't paying the true value of water, and that a lot of the uh, early federal water projects um, actually never uh, incorporated the cost of water. They're paying for the delivery and the infrastructure, and so you know, when we're talking about conservation, um, that economic incentive isn't necessarily there, and it should be. Well, I want to thank you both for coming and talking about this. If you could just stick around for a little bit, and we'll talk sure. a bit more for a web extra. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.